So going through different Old Testament difficulties or things that people might challenge from the Bible. There's some confusing parts of the Old Testament, things that don't exactly make sense to us all the time. We're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 22 tonight. Not a story that we go to very often, but one that that we should look at tonight. Let's take a look at it. 1 Kings 22, I'm going to read verses 1 through 36. For three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria, with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, had made iron horns, and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, as one man, the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? When he says here that all of Israel are scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd, that basically means that the armies are scattered and there is no one to lead them. So that's a bad prophecy. Micaiah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you will find out on the day you go to hide in an inner room. The king of Israel then ordered, Take Micaiah and send him back to Amon, the ruler of the city, 
and to Joash the king's son and say, this is what the king says, put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone small or great except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, surely this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But when Jehoshaphat cried out, the chariot commander saw that he was not the king of Israel and stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. The blood from his wound ran onto the floor of the chariot, and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread throughout the army, every man to his town, everyone to his land. That's where we'll stop. So this is kind of a a strange story. You get a little peek into the counsel of God in heaven here even. It might seem here like God is being deceptive with this whole story and that little insight that we have with the counsel of God there. The Bible is emphatic that God does not lie. I have a couple passages on the screen for you. Psalm 119, 160, all your words are true. Numbers 23, 19, this is Balaam to Balak. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. And then in Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. So the Bible is very emphatic that God does not lie. But then there's verse 23 here. The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. It's, a, it's an active verb there, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of these prophets of yours. So, what's going on there? Is God the author of deception here? Well, as I was studying for this passage, I found some Old Testament scholars, people who are pretty smart guys, who actually say that God is being deceptive here. One is named Walter Brueggemann. He says, and I have this on the screen here, Yahweh here obviously exercises no covenantal self-restraint, but is determined to have Yahweh's own way no matter what the cost, even if it means deceptive violence. There was another one too. What makes the Bible so problematic for theology is the representation in some of its narratives of Yahweh as being a being who uses lies or encourages deception in order to get his own way. In the story of Micaiah ben Imlah's vision, there is a prime example of Yahweh's involvement with lies. So, even Old Testament scholars, people who are really smart guys, people who study the Old Testament for a living, are saying, God is being deceptive here. For, for people who don't, don't believe, these difficulties, these these problems that we might run into in the Bible, this can be like blood in the water here. Like sharks smelling blood in the water. Aha, here's something we can jump on. But for those who do believe, difficulties are are just that. They're just difficulties. They're not contradictions. Everything God has revealed in His Word is true, as the Catechism says. So, this is, this is all true. This is accurate. This is not a contradiction. God permits people and spirits to do evil. This is a recurring theme throughout the Bible. One was this morning where God permitted Satan to go after Job and do a bunch of terrible things to him. God permitted that. And we talked about how Job 
basically charged God by saying, Lord, what are you doing to me? There's also Habakkuk, where he's wrestling with God. Why would you let the Chaldeans, of all people, those evil, awful Chaldeans, be the ones to bring judgment on your people? God keeps evil on a leash just long enough to accomplish his perfect purposes. Evil is always on a leash. And God determines how short that leash is. Sometimes he'll let it out a little more, sometimes he'll rein it in, but it's always on a leash. In every story, one story, Jesus at the Last Supper, speaking with Judas, it says that as soon as Judas took the morsel, the bread, it says Satan entered him, and Jesus says to him, what you are about to do, do quickly. So Jesus is basically giving a command there, do it quickly. It's on a leash. But God will allow harm and disaster to come. He does allow it to happen. In Isaiah 45, verse 7, it says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. So it's not like bad things that happen are accidents that God didn't mean for them to happen. God is orchestrating these things. And when there is disaster, it's for a reason. Sometimes disaster turns someone from error. So, for example, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, he goes crazy. He starts to think that, he starts to have so much success that he starts to think that he's God. And then he goes insane and he's eating grass out in the field until he recognizes that God is God and not him. So it turns him from error. Then the fall of Jerusalem. Judah is steeped in so much idolatry, it says they became even worse than the nations that the Lord drove out before them. The fall of Jerusalem is what brought them back to the true God, as awful as it was. So sometimes disaster turns somebody from error. Sometimes disaster is God's final judgment as in the case here with King Ahab. This was God's final judgment against him. It's putting an end to all of the, the bad things that he was doing. It's putting a stop to it. So God allows evil to happen even without causing it. He's still behind it. He still makes sure that it doesn't go any farther than it needs to. But he does allow it to happen and maybe the biggest example of that is the cross itself. The Bible never says God killed his own son. It never says that. But God is obviously putting the pieces in place for that event to happen, as awful as it was. And he used that awful event to make something wonderful. And we know that story. That's the gospel itself. So these disasters... God is behind them. He knows what he's doing. But this story here, God has decreed disaster for Ahab. This story is, at least in terms of deception, it's not God who's deceiving here. We deceive ourselves. That's the lesson of this story. God doesn't deceive us. We deceive ourselves. The farther that we drift away from God, the more we think we don't need Him. The more we think that our judgment is good and that we have a handle on things. The more we trust ourselves. That's what Ahab was doing. God, in this story, through that prophet, Prophet Micaiah, He revealed the lying spirit to Ahab ahead of time. All of these prophets were lying to Ahab. And so God said, um, all of these prophets are lying to you. God's not deceiving Ahab here. He's revealing the truth to Ahab here. 
If God tells Ahab of this lying spirit, how is he being deceptive? Being deceptive would require God to not expose the truth at all. But God does expose the truth to Ahab ahead of time. It's almost like giving him one last shot. If you go into battle, this is disastrous for you. Maybe you shouldn't go into battle. In this story here, Ahab, Ahab is an idiot. There's no two ways about it. He's an idiot. He's like one of those people who reads an instruction, don't try this at home, and then goes and does it anyways. Ahab has had divine judgment prophesied against him twice now. In these last two chapters, if you read the two chapters before that, each one has judgment pronounced on him. He should be expecting some bad things coming to him. He should be changing his ways a little bit. He doesn't. Ahab was about to go to war without considering God at all. He was about to form this coalition with King Jehoshaphat. Okay, let's go to war. I'm ready. Are you ready? It had to be Jehoshaphat who raised consideration of God. Hey, maybe we should seek the counsel of the Lord before we go into battle like this. It wasn't Ahab who was being cautious. It was Jehoshaphat. And Ahab, after he has all these prophets in front of him, Ahab would mistake God's word for 400 prophets speaking as people who are on his personal payroll. He has 400 prophets and he pays them. What kind of a message would you expect from somebody like that? Jehoshaphat asks for the counsel of the Lord and Ahab brings his own prophets who will speak just whatever he wants them to say. And if you noticed, if you look carefully in verse 6 there, when these prophets speak, they don't use the Lord's name there. Lord does not appear in all caps in verse 6. And then when Jehoshaphat, in the next verse, he asked to use the Lord's name. Jehoshaphat had to ask specifically for a prophet from the Lord, Yahweh. Can we have one of those prophets? And then when that prophet does show up, Ahab hears he is being deceived and he still believes the lie. He's told directly, you are being deceived. These prophets have a lying spirit behind them. They are decreeing disaster for you. He still believes the lie. He still thinks he's going to return safely. Verse 27, he says, lock up this prophet until I return safely. He's assuming that he's going to return safely. Everything's going to be fine. And then he thinks a disguise is going to ensure his safety. If he just dresses up like one of the soldiers, then they won't go after him. Because that's exactly what happened. He did anticipate that. They were looking for the king of Israel, and they were trying to pursue him, but then they realized, oh, that's not him, that's Jehoshaphat. So he did anticipate that, but he didn't anticipate how, how much God really is in control. I love how it that's worded there. Somebody shot his bow at random. He thought that he could control his own destiny, even with up and against an omnipotent God. Now maybe he wanted insurance just in case he was wrong, or maybe he thought that he could outsmart God's plan. But either way, this guy's an idiot. He's foolish. Ahab's problem is not that God is deceiving him. His problem is that he refuses to listen to the truth. He has the truth right at him. And he just doesn't listen to it. That's his problem. And here, God allows unbelief to run its natural course. If you disregard God, it's going to be bad. And that's what happens here. Ahab just doesn't like what this true prophet has to say. I like verse 8. There's still one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. 
So he prophesies bad things about me, so I don't like him. That's, that's the logic there. At least he's honest about it. Ahab wanted something else to be true. He didn't want to believe the actual truth. He wanted his own version of the truth to be true. And he wanted that so much that he tried to make it true. I'm going to just dress up as one of the soldiers and I'm going to outsmart God. I'm going to finagle my way around it. Kind of, when I was reading this, I was thinking about the last days of Hitler. There's, uh, if you read about what he was doing on those last days when the Russians were closing in around Berlin and you could hear the bombs going off and the artillery and everything, and he still thought that he had tons of armies that he didn't have. He would be on this map and he would move tanks into battle and say, I want this group to go here and this one to go there. He was totally delusional at the end. He wanted something else to be true. Human nature is not towards the truth, but towards the advantageous. We're not drawn to what's actually true by nature. We are drawn to what helps our advantage, what benefits us. So, between delightful fantasy and disappointing reality, we will choose the fantasy. When the reality is not the way we would like it to be, we'll make up something else and choose to believe that instead. That's human nature. There's a quote from a philosophy professor from New York University, Thomas Nagel. He says this, I want atheism to be true. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right about my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. He doesn't want reality that way. Instead of being drawn to reality the way it is, we're going to choose a fantasy that is to our advantage instead. Human nature is not bent towards the true God, but our own build a God. Most of us, there's, there's atheists out there, yeah. Most of us will believe in God, sure. But we believe Him on our own terms. We'll believe in the God that we would like. We'll kind of pick and choose the things about God that we would want our God to have. So if the virgin birth is not up to our scientific sensibilities, then let's throw that out. That doesn't make sense to our science, so let's not believe that. If total depravity, if that's a little too depressing, then we'll throw that out. Maybe we're not so bad. If eternal punishment sounds too mean, then we'll just throw that out. And if Jesus Christ is the only way, if that's not inclusive enough, then let's get rid of that too. We'll believe in God, sure. But we want our own version of God. We'll pick and choose the things that we want, and we'll create a God that's advantageous to us. A God that's convenient. And so, we would actually love to find something in the Bible that says, hey, God is deceptive. And the reason why we would if there's a little part of us that would want that is because then that would mean that we don't have to trust Him. We have license now because we don't have to trust God then we can just trust ourselves. We don't need God. So, when reading the Bible, get ready to be offended. Because the actual, real truth is not going to be advantageous to us. It's not our truth that the Bible reveals. It tells us that we are sinners worthy of eternal punishment. It says that we can't save ourselves no matter how good we are. It says that Jesus Christ is our only hope for being right with God. And it says that believing in Him means repenting. 
In other words, turning our lives upside down. This is not advantageous truth to us. This is hard stuff to hear. And it's easy to have heard it so many times that we kind of get immune to what that really means. Look for parts, the parts of the Bible that you don't like. Look for those. Instead of glossing over them, think about it for a bit. Let it set with you. If it bothers you, let it bother you. Don't just skip over it. Human nature is to skip over the stuff we don't like. If something bothers you, if it doesn't sit well with you, sit on it for a while. Maybe it's supposed to bother us. Maybe it's supposed to change us a little bit. Make us think about things a little different. We're kind of like Ahab with Micaiah. We want certain parts, but not all of it. And with those parts that we don't like, we'll just put them aside. So here's a few verses. Mark 8. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. That's hard hard to hear. And if you think about exactly what that means, it's even more hard to hear. Matthew 8, 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's a tall order. That's really difficult. But that's, a, that's an imperative from Christ Himself. Or a little later in Matthew, Matthew 19, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Said to a rich man. And all of us here, although we can easily find people who are more rich, we are very rich by the world's standards. This is hard stuff to hear. We don't like this. We would like to just kind of gloss over it or just not think about it. We would like to take these verses and and we won't kill we won't kill these verses or get rid of them. We won't deny biblical inspiration, but we'll be like Ahab and we'll just take this this prophet, this truth, and we'll just lock it up away from us. That's kind of what we do in our minds, isn't it? That makes us uncomfortable. I don't really like that one, so let's just stick it over there. Our God is not deceptive. He's truthful. And He is trustworthy. Even when we have uncomfortable things thrown at us, we can trust the Lord. He does love. He does want what's best for us. He aims to steer us from disaster if we would just listen and believe. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Let's talk to our God. Lord God in heaven, Lord, you've said many things to us in your word and by your spirit. And Lord, not all of them are easy to hear. Sometimes we are offended, bothered. Sometimes it is uncomfortable. But Lord, instead of being like Ahab, we pray, Lord, that we would hear what you have to say, that we would take it to heart even if it is uncomfortable. And that, Lord, we would be ready to to even change a little bit, to change our our minds about things, to change our, our attitudes and even our behavior so that, Lord, we would follow you and trust you even more. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.